Okay, can you guys hear me? Perfect. Okay. So in this class, we'll be looking into threads. So before, before understanding like why we need threads, uh, let's look at a real world uh, program where we might need multiple processors or we might need like parallel execution. By the way, readings for this uh, session would be from Dinosaur Book Chapter 5 and Comic Book 7, 8, and 6. So let's look at a real world example where we need uh, parallel processing, basically where we need to run multiple processes. Okay, so we'll consider the web server example. So uh, we all know how we can handle single request. Basically, we get a request from the user asking for a web page and web server gets the page and it renders the page and sends the re a response to the client. Okay. And however, as you can imagine, web server may need to handle multiple requests at all at the same time. Like there could be hundred people or thousand people trying to access the website. So web server should be able to access all the requests concurrently. So one obvious solution is to is for the parent process to fork as many process as needed. And then let each of these children process, child process uh, serve each request, right? So the way it looks uh, is like this. So consider uh, the web server for our course web page, okay? Engineering.purdue.edu, uh, WE469, like, so there is a web server that serves the web pages corresponding to this uh, URL. And imagine there are N processes that are running. So each process will be waiting for a request whenever somebody uh, an HTTP request comes like for index.html or lectures.html or labs, uh, labs web page. So each process will read the corresponding file and sends the file to the user. So there are a few observations that we can make here. So all the processes that are serving user requests, they all, they all have the same code, right? They all execute the same set of instructions and they all have access to the same set of files, like the folder, like the web, uh, the website folder, right? They all have access to all the files and all processes are equal in the sense there is no, there is no process which has, which is of higher priority than the other. So all processes are, have same level of access to all the system resources. The only thing that these processes differ is the data that they need to process. So the data from the user request that's different uh, for each process. And also, of course, the CPU state will be different because each process will be executing a request for different users. So the CPU state will be different. Apart from these two entities, all the other things are exactly the same. But unfortunately, all these processes are independent in the sense, each process has its same copy of code and data, and they have same copy of resources how, with different execution state. So there is a duplication of data among all these processes, which is not needed because they all use the same code and same resources, right? The only thing that is different is the execution state. So if we, if we take a step back and if we look at a process, we know that uh, a process has we define a process as a collection of uh, address space, which is memory that has all the code and data pages and resources, which have, which is like open files and uh, access to logs, so on and so forth, and then execution state. Okay. And how do process communicate with each other? They, they can either use shared memory or message passing. So, and then uh, the way they use shared memory is as we saw in lab two, they might use a shared memory handle for which they also need to do a system call. And similarly for in case of message passing, again, they can send and receive 
messages using system calls. But IPC in general, like inter-process communication in general is expensive because uh, there are many system calls that are involved in uh, enabling the communication. Like first the processes have to make system call to have access to the shared memory. And then in case of uh, message passing systems, send and receive are independent system calls. So in order to receive a message, they need to make a system call. Similarly, when they have to send a message, they, are get, they also have to make a system call. So can we make this more efficient? Now that we know that all the processes have the same copy of code and resources, can we separate the execution state, which is the only thing that is different from these processes, from the rest of the process? Now, process contains address space, like the memory layout, uh, privileges and resources, except for the execution state. And we separate the execution state out from the process. Basically, we take the execution state out of process control block, and we keep the execution state in a different structure, which we call thread of control or thread, okay? thread control block. So that is the main principle of thread. So thread, uh, formally we can define thread as a container for uh, execution state. Okay? And it is different from the set of processes, from the process. And e every thread is associated with the process. So thread cannot exist independently, right? Why? Because uh, in order to execute thread, thread needs memory and everything that is stored in the process structure. So we have thread that stores the execution state and we have process that's basically a container for all the resources that the thread has, thread uh, needs. So modern operating systems such as Linux, they actually maintain two different data structures. They have what we call task, which is basically process, uh, which is process control block without the execution state. Okay. And then they have, they have thread or thread control block, which contains execution state along with a pointer to the process. Okay. Now we separated these two entities. And as now you can imagine that there can be several threads that belong to the same process. How can that be possible? Because we can have several thread control blocks whose process pointer could be pointing to the same process control block. Okay. And now instead of scheduling processes, we schedule threads because we only need the execution state to do CPU scheduling. Since execution state is in thread control block, all our scheduling can be done just by using thread control blocks. So now the decision, now the scheduling happens between threads rather than processes. Now processes, now as of now, they just contain uh, just resources. Okay? They don't contain the execution state. So an example of uh, like single threaded uh, process, basically a process that has single thread of execution, as you can see, it just has uh, execution state, which is indicated by registers and uh, stack. And then the process for this thread contains everything else, which is code, data, and the resources, which are, for instance, files. And in case of multi-threaded program, we have multiple thread control blocks, okay, which are shown by the vertical blocks. And then they all share the same process control block as shown by the top row that has code, data, and files that are shared among all the threads. So basically what we do is when we are implementing threads, we take the execution state out of the process control block, basically the state of CPU and the stack, we put them in the thread control block, okay? And then we also have a pointer to the process control block uh, to access process info, memory, and uh, all the other resources, right? That's it. And then programming with threads is easy. 
because uh, we'll, we'll look into an example of how to create threads. It's very easy. C and C++ actually provides nice APIs using which you can uh, create threads. And since they all share the same data here, global variables are now shared among all the threads. We'll look into an uh, example, like we'll show, uh, we'll look into a code to understand how the data is shared between all the threads, okay? And they need more synchronization because now threads, unlike processes, which have their own copy of code and data, threads, they all share the same data and same code. So any, all the data accesses, except for uh, local variables needs to be synchronized. So a P thread example is all shown as shown on the slide. So here we create two threads. Uh, threads are created in Linux. For instance, if you are using POS6 threads, which stands for P thread, you use P thread create to create thread. So here thread one is just a container for like thread pointer and then print message is the pointer to the function that the thread should execute. And the last argument is the parameter for the thread function. Okay, and then uh, the parent thread. Now, like once you call p thread create, there are two threads. The first one is main thread. The second one is the, the thread that you just created. And then uh, p thread join. Note that unlike fork, okay? Unlike fork, fork actually starts executing from the second instruction, right? But p thread, thread actually starts executing from the mess, uh, function that you gave, okay? So if you have replaced a P thread with fork, what happens is fork actually starts executing from next instruction. Whereas when you create thread, it actually starts executing from the function that you gave, which is in this case, print message. Can then a parent thread can call P thread join using the thread pointer to wait for the thread to complete. And then eventually uh, parent thread just prints the return value of each thread and then it exits. Now let's actually look into the look into some code examples to understand the difference between threads and processes. Okay, so let me share my terminal. Can you folks see my, ter my terminal? Okay, good. So uh, let's look at fork example, okay? Let's first look at uh, the fork that we all understand very well. Let's look at fork. So uh, so what are we doing here? So here the parent process first calls fork and then this is just error handling. And here the child process where the fork return zero, what we do is we initialize some random number generator. You can ignore this. This is just a way to uh, initialize uh, libc random number generator so that we can generate uh, truly random numbers. And then we just initialize, there are two variables here in this program. There is one global variable and local variable. Okay. So child process initializes, first initializes global variable to some random value and then prints the global variable. Similarly, it initializes local variable to random value 
and uh, prints the local variable. Okay. And then what child process does is it just prints the value of global and local in a loop by sleeping one second. Okay. So it prints basically every second it comes and then it just prints the value of local and global for 10 times. Okay. The parent process, it also initializes the random numbers and parent process, what it is doing is it's initializing like it in a loop, it changes the value of global and local, and then it prints the value, like the change in value of global and local, and then it sleeps again for 10 times. So here, as you can see, parent process and child process, their child process is just reading the value of global and local, and parent process is actually writing the values of global and local, okay? Now, let's execute this code. Okay. okay. So, okay, let me... Let me copy this thing into a file. So let's look at child, okay? So child changes the value of global to some random value. And then this value never changes. Once the global value is set to some, uh, some arbitrary value in child, the same value stays, okay? So child changes the global value to this. And then the global value is now Every time the child is called, the global value is same, right? So basically, uh, the changes done by the parent to the global variable doesn't affect the child. Because if you see, for instance, parent changes global. Ah, uh, that's okay. Somebody, Jacob asked the question. I'll come to that question right after this. So a uh, parent is changing the global variable, but you can see that child, when it is accessing the global variable, it's the same old value with the, with the, which the child set in its process. So this shows that uh, this kind of like confirms our understanding that parent and child, they never share the data. Even global variables, they are different, okay? Okay, now coming back, uh, coming back to the Jacob's question. So Jacob's question is, why do child and parent have the same initial global and local variables? So basically what Jacob is asking is, why is that parent is setting the changing global variable to, the, to, to one value and child is also setting to the same value, although we are using random numbers. The thing is, that's a very good question. So the thing is, so here you see, like we are initializing, uh, we, we are using srand to initialize the state of the random number generator. That's why like when they both start at the same time, the time gives uh, the seconds at which you started. So if, because we are using time sharing systems, they, they would have executed SRAND at the same time. So they can be different by, if we can just put sleep, for instance, let's say, let's put sleep here, let's say in case of child. Okay. Uh, let me install again.
By the way, which editor you guys used to write C code? So here we can actually Emacs, <laughs> nice. So we can actually sleep. Let's say let's let's explicitly put sleep here so that uh, the child process gets different time. Okay. Good. Now let's compile this guy. Okay. Let's see. Okay, there you go. So when we set the sleep, we are forcing the random number generation. Basically, we are. This ensures that the time returns different values in parent and child, and that's how the. That's why SRAN gets initialized with different value. That's why you see like uh, the changing global value would be different in uh, parent and child, for instance. Parent has two, one, something. Child has basically. This ensures that the random number state, random number generator state, is different. We forced it by putting a sleep. Okay. Uh, Jacob, did you get it? Yep. Okay. Cool. Now we saw an example of fork. Let's look into threads. So here we are creating uh, similar to fork. Instead of process, we are now creating a thread. So here the thread function is same. So with thread function here again there are two variables, global and local. Okay. And uh, thread function here you can see the thread function. That means the child. It also first initializes global and local to some random values, and then in a loop it just prints the values of global and local and the main process or like main thread or it changes the value of global and local in a loop and it prints the change in value so in process the changes made by the parent did not affect the child process right whereas in case of threads it does affect let's see how it affects Okay. okay, cool. So here, first, let's see what happens to the global variable. Actually, you know what? Let me save and uh, using grep might be easier. Okay. Oh. So here, as you can see, the child actually sees the modifications done by parent to the global variable because, see, parent changes the global variable to 1661. Now child changes. Child uh, reads the recent value. Now parent changes the global variable to 715. Now child also sees the same global variable. This child sees the change. Now whenever parent changes, the global variable child also sees the same change. So basically global variables are shared among all the threads of a process. Okay. Now let's look at local variables. So local variables looks like local variables did not change because you can see So 
looks like once the child changes the local variable, it's the changes are local. Okay. However, in global variables, it's different because they are actually changed by the parent. Like basically child thread, the changes made to the global variables are visible to the child thread. Whereas uh, in case of processes, all the changes are invisible. Okay. I think uh, that's it. Do you guys have any questions related to threads? Okay, I think uh, that's uh, that's basically it for the class. I'll provide more examples, uh, like I'll I'll be adding quiz maybe mid of next week. So where I'll provide more examples by mixing fork and uh, p thread. Maybe that'll that'll help you understand uh, like the interplay between fork and threads, like the processes on thread. Uh, if you don't have any questions, by the way, I saw that uh, there were a few students who were waiting in the waiting room during my office hours. I was busy with other students, so uh, I can continue office hours now. So if anybody has any doubts related to project or anything, please ping me on chat. You can send a personal message on the chat, I can open a session with you and uh, like you can ask your questions. So yeah, we are done for the class now. Yes. So all, for all the Thursdays classes, the link is same. The link is posted on the class web page, by the way. Thank you.